Today's guest is Dr. Sidney Cohen. He is a psychologist in private practice for over four decades in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, his practice includes psychotherapy and life coaching. He has published two self-help books, which are both available on Amazon and Kindle. Kendall, and those are called Inner Blocks to Losing Weight and also Your Self-Sabotaging Inner Bully. Um, this is Dr. Sid's second time on the show. Um, two areas of focus for him are, well, I mean, he has a lot. <laughs> he's been doing this for over four decades. You know, he's definitely strong in a lot of areas in therapy, but um, two areas of focus for him are losing weight and also betrayal trauma. So today we did kind of a fun dance between the two of understanding betrayal trauma when it comes from someone else and under understanding ourselves and how to navigate that path in a healthy way. And then also when we betray ourselves, which definitely happens on a losing weight journey and how to navigate that in a healthy way as well. And he gives practical strategies and also just insights into, you know, really just to be more, um, uh, self-compassionate, allowing with ourselves and also give you a heads up on things to expect and normalize some of those experiences that so often, um, you know, I think it's like almost everyone has experienced these things, but, um, when you're in it, you feel so alone and like no one understands. And so I think just giving voice to some of these common experiences is very healing in and of itself, not to mention strategies, um, and like real life tactics. Um, and deeper insights and of understanding that Dr. Sid shares with us on the show today. Um, he is a uh, active practicing coach and therapist. Um, so if you would like to uh, work with him directly or learn more about what he has to offer, his website is Sydney J. Cohen, that's C O H E N P H D dot com. I'm um, just going to add real quick. He also works with um, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and panic disorders, OCD stress and anger management. He works with a lot of couples he mentions at the end. So yeah, there's all sorts of things that um, he can help with. And I hope you guys get some value out of the show today. It was a fun uh, discussion we had kind of dancing around uh, the similarities between these two different types of betrayal, both from others and with ourselves. So we'll go ahead and jump into it. Here is Dr. Sydney Cohen. Okay. So Dr. Sid, I'm so excited to have you back on the show. We're going to get all into betrayal today, weight loss. We're going to get into self-betrayal and, you know, maybe navigate into a little bit more of betrayal trauma from others. We'll see where the conversation takes us because these are two topics that you are expert in. You've been doing this a very long time. So appreciate you coming on and appreciate your energy and just all that you bring to the table. So thank you for being here. Are you ready to, Great to be play? Back. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, we were talking before we started about one of your books, Inner Blocks to Losing Weight. And we were talking about betrayal and um, you gave off a definition of betrayal. I was wondering if we could kick it off with that and kind of piggyback this be betrayal definition into how that impacts us when we're trying to lose weight or change our health in some way. Sure. So the definition I use of betrayal, I mean, everybody knows the word, enough people in the world obviously experience betrayal. So I kind of go with like a working definition of betrayal. Any painful feeling of letdown by someone important to you based on what you believed you had the right to believe they would never do to you. I like using that definition because it has a pretty wide range of applicability. So if we're talking betrayal by someone else, then we could be talking about certainly infidelity. We could be talking about a pattern of lying. Anything that is going to make you feel betrayed in terms of it's a painful feeling. You are let down. It is somebody important to you. And you believed you had the right to believe they would never do that to you. With, with just as a little postscript, the more important the person is and the more important the topic is, then the worse the feeling of betrayal is going to be. So that's more betrayal by someone else. But as, as you mentioned right at the beginning there, Tara, there can be a form of self-betrayal also when basically you, you're still going with the idea of a painful feeling of letdown. But in this case, the letdown is you by yourself. So if we think of that as a form of self-betrayal, then, well, frankly, a prime example of that could be when somebody is saying and sounding determined to lose weight, 
saying and sounding they're determined to stay disciplined, stay the course on eating the right foods and getting the right amount of exercise. And then when yet on the other hand, they proceed to not do that and sabotage yourself by not eating well, not eating in a healthy way and not getting that exercise. It may stretch the term a little bit, but in a sense, you are betraying yourself when you sabotage your efforts to lose weight, hence self-betrayal. Mm. And this kind of, you know, probably piggy, piggybacks with your other book, your self-sabotaging inner bully, right? Like I'm sure we can kind of flex between both of those here. So, you know, from a therapy therapist perspective, like what's the first thing, you know, let's talk about what you experience um, emotionally when there's been betrayal, whether from someone else or yourself, um, you know, what, what's the, fir- the, the emotions that one experiences in that period of, wow, like I am devastated here in the aftermath of betrayal, you know, can you share some typical experiences that might h- humanize the experience people have when they have these kind of experiences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let me just first add one little piece of betrayal when it's a betrayal from someone else. The worst kind of betrayal of all, I mean, betrayal is obviously bad enough, but the worst kind of betrayal, the most distressing, distraught creating uh, type of betrayal is when you're blindsided. You didn't see it coming. You didn't have a clue. It hits you squarely in the face. And yet you had absolutely no indication that that was happening. So that is the worst kind of betrayal. And how I especially mean it's the worst kind of betrayal is it's going to trigger three main feelings and they're all pretty guaranteed to be pretty darn intense. Mistrust, probably the most obvious. It's going to be awfully difficult to trust that person anymore if you feel betrayed by them. But the other two for sure are hurt and anger. Hurt Mm -hmm. and anger, big time. Both of those feelings go with every betrayal. Sometimes you're more aware of feeling hurt. Other times you're more aware of feeling angry. Sometimes it fluctuates. It could be even within the same day. But the bottom line is both of those feelings are virtually guaranteed to be felt intensely. In the worst case scenario, if a betrayal is just so devastating, as you were just using that word, the most devastating and blindsiding kind of betrayal can be outright traumatizing. And when it's outright traumatizing, what you're going to end up with is a lot of hurt and anger for sure. Yes, a lot of mistrust for sure, yes, but even worse, you're gonna end up very possibly with clinical problems. You could end up with depression. You could end up with anxiety. You could end up with PTSD for goodness sakes. So worst case scenario, a blindsiding betrayal that ends up hurting so badly, brings up so much resentment. And the resentment, by the way, can lead to bitterness and people have to be careful about that all of which can not only be so painful for you, but can also then be sabotaging for relationships. Mm. So when someone's in this place, right, of betrayal, trauma, um, you know, what do you recommend? Let's say it's, it is from somebody else, but we can kind of, you know, uh, together kind of navigate these uh, similarities as we go. You know, what what do you recommend um, in terms of taking care of oneself or knowing what to expect in that phase of the betrayal trauma when it's acute? Without a doubt, the number one priority is healing. The most important thing is to begin the healing process. And part of the recognition and and prioritizing of the healing process is to, to go with, to embrace and allow all of those painful feelings to be there because they belong there. There's no judgment that should be in any way attached to those feelings of hurt and anger and also frustration and disappointment, discouragement. All of those feelings can set in. Those feelings need to be leaned into. They need to be acknowledged and they need to be allowed to be there. And throwing that into the mix, given all of those painful feelings that can really accumulate and fester as they can, then it's so important as part of that healing to go to self-care, to go to self-comfort and self-compassion, because your priority has to be, you need to take care of you. 
Because you at that moment, maybe there are people in your life you can turn to, sure. Maybe you can do some journaling for sure. But the most important thing is to recognize that given the pain you're now in, you need to heal. And, and I just to, to kind of add one thing to that real quick. There are a lot of people in this world, I, I think we both know Tara, who will go around and say, well, you know, you have to learn to forgive. As far as I'm concerned, especially at that initial crisis point, as you put it, forgiveness is way, way on the back burner. Whether it even comes on the burner at some point or not, the priority is healing. But what can also happen to just one more thing related to forgiveness, what some people get caught up in when their inner bully or inner critic takes over is they can actually start blaming themselves as though somehow they deserve to be betrayed. They deserve this kind of pain. Part of the healing then is to make sure to get that kind of thought and feeling out of the mix entirely because there's no way in the world anybody who's ever betrayed deserves it. And that nasty little inner bully inside can try to get people to actually start getting down on themselves when they were the victim, the victim of the betrayal. You can't afford, nobody can afford to kind of add victimization of yourself by in any way blaming yourself or in any way thinking you deserved it. You got to just get the healing process started. Mm, thank you. Yeah. The, the feeling, the feeling of emotions, allowing those things um, and not turning it into over responsibility, taking it upon yourself. Uh, you know, what did I do wrong? I think that's a really common thing I see happen with betrayal trauma is like, well, what did I do to cause this? What it, what, you know, I must've not been vigilant enough, or I must have been too nice, or I must've not been enough for them, or I must've, you know, um, and I think it's an attempt for control over a situation that, a, a huge loss of control has just been experienced in. And so I want to hit a little deeper on, on this, um, because I think, I do think that a f it's very uncomfortable to feel s deep sadness and grief mm. and despair and hopelessness and embarrassment, you know, and my betrayals that I've experienced, that was, you know, I totally went into that last pattern that you mentioned. I was just like, well, what did I do to contribute to this? And it, it was totally this, um, attempt to con feel in control, um, when I didn't. Right. And, and a fear, a, a pattern, a lifelong pattern of not being willing to feel those uncomfortable emotions. Right. So let me just mask this in forgiveness and what can I do to fix it? <laughs> right. And man, like being willing to just feel emotions without judging them, without actually including anyone else is another thing I've learned. Like I can feel anger. I can you know, rage in my car and swear and say all sorts of profanities and sob and get all those things out without actually having to include anyone else in those moments. You know, I don't have to go directly. Like, you know what else I think is messed up this. I mean, I'm not judging it, whatever it's, you know, the th those things might happen, but being willing to just feel it all and process it all on my own has been life changing in my, in terms of my emotional health. And so, um, what I kind of wanted to, uh, I guess, ask there what was coming to mind was like, what have you seen happen when people do kind of bypass like that? Or, or did you hear me there? Sorry, I don't know if it yep, cut sorry. off. Okay. Um. What, what, you know, I don't know if you have an answer for this, but what have you seen happen in people who skip these steps, right? They're not willing to feel all the grief and sadness right. and hurt and anger. They're just kind of bypassing it. Like, that's okay. And let me just fix the situation. Like what happens in the years following that? You know, what happens when somebody skips those steps of processing and doesn't allow that to naturally uh, get out of their system? Depends which direction that leads. And what I mean by that, Tara, is if it goes inward, where a lot of those feelings then are basically squelched. Like I was saying, they fester inside. And the more they fester inside, the more somebody who's keeping those feelings festered inside, especially all the hurt and the resentment and, again, disappointment, frustration, discouragement and all that, the more it stays internalized, the more you are making yourself vulnerable to withdrawing, avoiding, socially distancing, 
the kinds of things that are just going to keep those feelings alive and kicking inside and kicking you and not getting addressed and processed and resolved at all. Mm -hmm. Or they can go the opposite direction. And the opposite direction then meaning outwards is it can lead to somebody becoming more and more agitated, more and more coming out, sounding on the attack, getting mean, getting engaging in the kind of communication that can be very distancing and very sabotaging to the relationships. Not necessarily to full blown rage, but certainly sounding like on the attack a lot, certainly being very uncompromising, certainly not taking accountability. A lot of blame, a lot of accountability shifting onto the other person, all because what you've allowed to happen inside, whether you consciously realize it or not, is to externalize all that anger that you didn't deal with, all of that hurt that you didn't deal with, you're taking it out on other people and then back to sabotage, you increase the chance that you're gonna sabotage at least some relationships, unless you got somebody in your life who's willing to be incredibly patient and incredibly tolerant, and that's not guaranteed. Mm, thank you. Okay, let's kind of go back to our, you know, uh, self-inflicted, you know, the betrayal trauma in terms of, you know, weight loss and things like that on this note. Um, I mean, I've been through all the, I've been through all these, I'm sure a lot of you guys have, I'm sure a lot of us have, you know, um, but when I had, when I was on my health journey and would have these moments of, you know, binged on all the things and I'm sitting there in this, you know, frustration with myself, mad at myself and that whole phase. I, I can relate to this because I would like I, that would then in turn cause me to have um, uh, poor communication with those closest to me. Right. Because I'm mad at myself. So now I'm in this bad mood and then I'm just crabby to be around. And I know y'all listening. I know y'all been there <laughs> if you've ever tried to lose weight. Right. So um, let's go into more of like healthy, the healthy emotional processing and even cognitive processing. When let's say you're trying to lose weight and you just drove to the gas station and bought like all the candy and all the chips and all the, all the junk food and you had your binge and now it's the next morning and you've been working so hard and you're so frustrated with yourself and mad at yourself, disappointed in yourself, you know, where do you recommend someone go internally when they are in that place to get into a more healthy place with themselves? You know, one of the things that really brings up for me when you, when you ask that, it's, it's really a, a, it's a delayed regret. It's a delayed frustration. You know, by this point, to feel guilty, to feel regret, you know, it's kind of too late. You've already gone and sabotaged yourself whether it's in terms of not exercising, eating certain foods late at night or whatever that you shouldn't have eaten. Yeah, okay, so now it is a couple of hours later the next morning, there's the guilt, there's the regret. It's, I kind of think of it and I tell people I work with, it's really wasted regret and guilt. It's not, it's already too late to have done anything about what you just did hours ago, a day ago, whatever. Unfortunately though, it also tends to not really deter you the next time. So hours later, a day or two later, there you may be again, really tempted to eat more than you should or something you shouldn't. There you may be feeling, eh, you know, I can do my exercise tomorrow. The regret and guilt that you may have felt the day before or whatever is something you have to really try to bring back into consciousness. And that still doesn't guarantee that it's going to have the impact you want to have. So if you can mindfully say to yourself, hey, look how much regret and guilt I felt. Look how much I let my inner bully really kick my ass on this for having sabotaged myself. Hopefully that kind of mindfulness will then take effect. And the next time you feel the temptation you do, you're really mindfully focusing on that guilt and regret. Maybe, no guarantee, but maybe that's something that'll help deter you. However, it's a little more complicated than that, I think, because bring back the inner bully into the mix or inner critic. If, it, if the basic message you're getting subconsciously from your inner bully, inner critic is you don't really deserve to achieve the result you want. You don't really deserve it. 
if that's kind of the underlying message, and again, it may be purely subconscious, but the more somebody sabotages themselves in trying to lose weight, I kind of go under the assumption that is at least part of the underlying message mm -hmm. that the person wants to lose weight. That's kind of a black and white, you know, consciously you want to lose weight, but consciously knowing you want to lose weight doesn't guarantee that inside deep down, you're feeling you really deserve to. Right. And when the inner bullies kind of got you hooked inside, you, know, you don't really deserve that. Then it becomes an approach avoidance thing. You mm -hmm. approach by taking the steps to not sabotage yourself, to eat the right things and get the exercise. But then when you end up sabotaging, you're sabotaging yourself back to avoid. Approach, avoid, approach, avoid. That's mm -hmm. kind of the proverbial roller coaster ride that, of course, we both know a lot of people go through in their attempts to lose weight. Mm, yeah, I find um, I found for myself and also in many I've coached that in that in the heat of the moment of that, you know, inner bully just running rampant, like, I can't believe you did that. Uh, maybe I don't even want to think about it, but I'm definitely thinking about it. And I'm so frustrated with myself. Blah, 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 blah. If instead you can pull out another part of yourself that is neutral, mm -hmm. loving, compassionate and curious Right. And it's going to take some pattern breaking to get there when it's the inner bullies just been running that show, which I really feel drives addiction. Right. Can't believe you did that. Let me kick you down to the ground. Now you do feel small and unworthy. And that's how you can operate in life. And is that it's just like you have this internal dictator that's just like, stay small, stay small, stay small. So if you can find within yourself in the heat of the moment of that guilt and shame and, you know, frustration and, mad at yourself and all that a loving part that says hey 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 you know like i wonder what's going on like i wonder i wonder why i love the question i wonder why i wonder why i binged last night that has a whole different energy to it you know and i have found that also to be so um healing right it's just like maybe if you your your spouse cheated on you you thought you had a model marriage and everything seemed great and you found out nope they've been cheating on you for 20 years like crazy the whole time you know it, what i think what would be so healing is to have someone say like you know i how are you feeling just hold space for you just let you cry just hear it all you know and i find that you know with that within ourselves in terms of you know making choices that we aren't super proud of after the fact holding space for ourselves like that of like hey just listening you know i wonder what was going on it's like oh well i was stressed out of my mind and like that's what I do. That's what I do when I'm stressed and I didn't know what else to do. And it's like, that's, that's understandable, you know, like, well, you know, maybe you know, what, what do you think you could try next time? You know, that, that kind of gentle, loving space holding I have found had to be extremely effective, you know, extremely effective in that space also. And that kind of, you know, segues me back over. Cause I, I like this little dance we're doing between, you know, actual relationship betrayal trauma and self betrayal trauma or self-betrayal. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to hit back over to the relationship space, you know, um, in terms of, cause I'm sure this is landing for many people because I mean, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure it's like, who hasn't been through betrayal trauma of some sort, most mm -hmm. of us. Right. And so when like going back to the relationship side of things, um, so now you're in a space where you're like, okay, I'm allowing myself to feel this. I'm allowing myself to be hurt. I'm allowing myself to be angry. Uh, you know, all of those things in terms of, um, strategies, like obviously getting a therapist would be ideal. I really wish I had, <laughs> I shouldn't say wish I had, but that would have been really helpful for me during a couple of phases of my life mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. You know, um, in terms of, uh, you talked about self-care, you know, but what are some strategies specifically, you know, in that self-care that you find are very helpful for people who have been through betrayal in terms of a close relationship? I think what's so important to do when, when somebody is hurting like that is you need to really make, I think, some lists, some very mm -hmm. specific, tangible lists. For example... One thing I like to recommend to people is to make, I, I just call it a self-esteem list. And basically mm -hmm. all it is, it's, it's a simple idea. It's just not always easy to do. You make a list in one word adjectives of what you really like about yourself. 
what are the positive, likable personality traits you have that when you think of those traits, that's what allows you to say, hey, here's what I like about me, especially on the inside. Because just as a quick aside to that, too many people, I think you and I both know, get caught up in self-esteem as mainly having to revolve around physical appearance. We all know it's socialization, it's conditioning, particularly, of course, for women who so end up disproportionately prioritizing the external over the internal for self-esteem. That's why I so pitch a list like this. Make a list, come up with as many one-word adjectives. If you're in any way struggling or the unit bullies kind of make it hard to think of some of those adjectives, ask somebody in your life who you really trust, who really cares about you, ask them to help you add things to the list because they know you very well. So they then get to add things and you end up with what hopefully is a real solid list of what it is that you like about you in here. Mm. Because if you're hurting over a betrayal and feeling maybe not necessarily totally worthless, but obviously, you know, now you're real down on yourself, sad and grieving and hurting and all that. One of the things you need to make sure to hold on to, hold on to tightly is to be reminding yourself. You make this list and you look at it every day. Just take 30 seconds. It's not anything you have to spend a lot of time on. Just look at that list every day mm -hmm. and reinforce for yourself and really stay mindful. Hey, I don't want to ever forget just what I'm really worth and what I really do have to offer to other people and to myself. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one type of list. Another type of list is a little bit more, say, in the area of what you're accomplishing, what you're doing. And I don't mean it has to be, you know, your job or anything that involves major goals. I'm just talking even about little stuff, you know, acts of courage, acts of kindness, things you do where, you know, was a bad habit or whatever, and you got control over yourself, something you did that day that was fun or creative. That I call the self-credit list, something where you're giving yourself a little pat on the back for anything you did that day that you feel good about that is good for your spirits, it's good for your soul. Mm -hmm. Those are just two examples of the kind of lists. They're both tangible. They're both something that you can be reinforcing yourself every day for. They're not the whole healing process, of course, but I think they're a really important part mm -hmm. of you then comforting yourself, taking care of yourself, and, and, and also throwing journaling into the mix. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as you were saying, Tara, you need to be able to embrace and express these feelings and not necessarily to anyone else. Sure you can, but journaling obviously is a way to express them to yourselves. So you got a self-esteem list, you got a self-credit list, you got journaling as just three kinds of tools that I, I just can't recommend enough. Mm, I love those answers, um, not only specifically for that, but also going back, we go to our dance of self-betrayal with weight loss. Um, one thing that I have found is like when someone gets in these spirals like this, like, oh man, I just ruined everything. I suck. I'm never going to be able to do this. I haven't even gone to the gym all week. And I, I'm just, I, I, I suck, right? It's just this huge, like I suck fest, you know? And even in like a personal growth journey of apart from weight loss of just, you know, working on patterns and, you know, belief systems and how I see life, I find it is so human nature where it's just so easy to get focused on the negative, right? It's kind of that, you know, negative bias that we have for survival. It like really, really impacts our day-to-day -day lives. And I found that focusing on all that, all, all that you are, that your, your internal worth of who you are apart from this weight loss journey, apart from any sort of growth needed, you don't need any sort of growth to, to, to see your value. These are things that we do um, to enhance our own experience in life, not to make us more valuable or better, or, you know, it, somehow in cha change our intrinsic value as human beings of who we are. Right. And so I think all of those really apply to this scenario too, in terms of, okay, yep. You binge last night, but let's also focus on all the wonderful things you have been doing. <laughs> you know, those get just completely forgotten in these moments. And I think that's a really, really great tool to use. Of Let's start focusing on everything that you're doing well as a way to just pick yourself up and brush yourself off and be like, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot 
I've been doing, you know, what did you call it? Self credit list. I like that self credit list. You know, I do that with my clients every Friday is have them share in a group setting what they, what something they're doing really well. What was a win this past week? And you can just feel it in the energy, right? Like if they're kind of down on themselves, they're like, well, I did. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, dude. And they're like, yay. Okay, cool. I'm not a loser. Like I was kind of feeling like a second ago, you know? So really, really helpful strategies too. If you're, you're binging or you're falling off track is like, start noticing one who, how beautiful you are apart from this whole endeavor you're doing, who are you at your core? And then also note, giving yourself credit for all the wonderful actions that you have been taking and journaling out feelings. I love all of those. You know, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me. And probably I figure you too. How many people, doesn't matter how intelligent they are, accomplished they are, things that are really, we can know are really good about them, so struggle to give themselves that pat on the back. Mm -hmm. Really find it al almost painful by itself. Mm -hmm. So for anybody to be able who's that reluctant and has that much difficulty doing that to actually even just think about this, that's already an accomplishment because mm -hmm. it's already then switching your mindset into a poor, more positive mindset. And for some people, that really is an accomplishment by themselves. Mm -hmm. Another thing I wanted to say, though, back to the idea of people going off track, whether it's food, exercise or both. I'm a big, I'm big on semantics and words obviously can mean different things to different people. One word resonates for one person may not for another, et cetera. So one of the things I like to talk to my, my, my patients about, whether it's a, you know, a therapy patient or, or a coaching client is the difference between a detour, a setback and a failure. Nice. And they're, they're just not equivalent. Right. It's so easy when you start getting off track with your food and with your exercise to go right to that F word. And that F word failure to me is a bigger F word than the F word because <laughs> psychologically it's really toxic to go to the quote F word. However, if you have slipped, okay, you didn't eat well for lunch or dinner, you had an extra snack you shouldn't have, or you missed a couple of days of exercise. It's not just semantics to me to call it a detour. You temporarily got off the path and you're going to get back on the next day. That exactly. cuts out the chance of the inner bully or critic taking you to failure or taking you to even think of as a major setback. You detour. Now, mm -hmm. we both know that if you start detouring a lot, well, that's going to be hard not to look at as a setback. But a day or two where you're really off track, it's a detour. What's a detour? Obviously, on a road, you're temporarily off getting back on. <laughs> I love that so much. It, I had to uh, take a detour on the road yesterday. I was trying, kind of trying to get home. I had some client calls and I was like, oh, the road's closed. And when you said that, I imagined like me pulling up to where the road's closed and just parking my car and like crying, like, oh, now I can't go home. You know, <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's how we get emotionally is like, oh, it's over. I failed. I have to just sit here. There's nothing that can be done. It's like, oh, you can just you keep going just a little bit. All right, keep going. Okay, cool. Now you're back on track. And I really appreciate those semantics. I like that a lot because I constantly, you know, even my son, he's, he's got some muscle gain. He's 16. He's, you know, lifting with all his friends at school and the class and he's got all these goals. And he's like, what do you do if you get off track? And I'm like, oh, you just don't worry about it, dude. You just, just jump right back in. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's funny how we are like that, right? We're so, um, we catastrophize a lot as humans, right? We, we catastrophize and judge. Yeah. Because to go to the quote F word or even the word, you know, where it's big setback, there's judgment. And when there's judgment, there's going to be hurt and there's going to yeah. be negative feelings, obviously vicious circle, spiral Shame. down, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's Brene. Yeah. Brene Brown's quote about shame that I love is you need three things in a petri dish for shame to grow exponentially secrecy silence and judgment you just reminded me of that and that is what happens mm -hmm. right like you you binge or whatever you're not talking to anybody about it you're not telling anybody about it and you're judging yourself like crazy and shame is just shame just grows like this petri dish you're just like oh i suck you know and so that's what going back to your strategies of those lists 
is a really helpful tool. I like that a lot because we have to be able to like pull ourselves out of that and also talking about it, right? Also having, if you have a therapist or a coach or a safe friend or some sort of Facebook group or, you know, coaching group you're in or anything like that, being able to talk about it openly and get that off your chest and for that to be received, you know, you kind of have to be a little mindful of who you share it with, right? Because when you share something you're holding shame about to somebody who just rips you a new one with judgment, that kind of also makes the shame get worse, right? So be careful about your audience a little bit. If you know that your husband per se is really mean to you when you eat donuts, well, that's why you shouldn't be doing this anyway. You know, like maybe he's not the one to go to <laughs> in that moment, right? Yeah, that but, would be the person to definitely not go to. <laughs> yeah. And there or are those people. Like and you already know who they are. So stop going yep. to them. <laughs> yeah. I want to bring one more thing into the mix, if I may, before I forget. Um, it's about shoulds and supposed to. Mm. Again, another kind of semantic thing. I'm sure, you know, you know what I yeah. mean on this one. Oh, yeah. So people get mired in the shoulds and the supposed to. You know, I, I yeah. should eat today, you know, just a certain number of calories and that it, and that's it. I should make sure to exercise today, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Shoulds and supposed tos are virtually guaranteed to backfire. They're just not going to get what you are saying that you quote should get or shouldn't get or do or whatever. Mm -hmm. So have this little thing. It's not going to always work by any means. And it takes a lot of practice to make this shift off of shoulds and supposed tos and, you know, this room to tweak these words a little bit in my best interest. Mm. To eat the right food, to mm. only eat a certain amount, that's in my best interest. To get some exercise in today, that's in my best interest. Yes. It's in my best interest physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationship wise. Yes. In my best interest has back to judgment. There's none. No judgment, no implied criticism, no right. pressure. It's just, it's in my best right. interest to do this. Right, right. That pressure should think, I mean, even just hearing you say, like if I'm if I'm going to say I should eat the Brussels sprouts in my fridge for lunch, something about that word just makes me not want to do it, right? But if I say anything else, pretty much like, ooh, I can't wait to have Brussels sprouts after this. Like now all of a sudden I want to, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. The should and supposed to, it just, it literally activates your inner rebel. Just those words, it's something about human nature, our sovereignty as human beings. When we're told we should do something, at least for me, that makes me want to not want to do it. Like if you want to get me rebelling, tell me I'm supposed to, you know? So yeah, I love that you're highlighting that. And, and in my best interest, I would say is a way of life for me now of, I don't have mm -hmm. to go to the gym. I don't have to go to bed early. I don't have to eat healthy. I don't have to not eat sugar. I don't have to any of those healthy habits. It's just, I want, I'm doing what I choose to do. And yeah, sometimes I might eat sugar or have pizza or not work out, but I stand beside myself. I stand with myself in those decisions of like, this feels like truly the best choice for me right now. And I stand by myself mm -hmm. with that, but it's taken years of practice to get there. A mm -hmm. lot of self-abandoning patterns and inner bully and inner critic blah, 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 and had to do a lot of self-love work and a lot of strategies and a lot of coaches and all of that. But when you can get into, um, I'm choosing what's in my own best interest and that might change, right? Like sometimes going, most of the time going to bed early is my choice, right? It's like, cause that's in my own mm -hmm. best interest, but occasionally there's something going on socially that I'm like, no, I choose that. That one is in my own best that I choose that knowingly, you know, it might kind of mess up my flow tomorrow. And I choose that because this is, I'm prioritizing this on the fly. Yes. This is more important to me right now. And in that energy, you're always with yourself. Right. But if I were to actually choose a social engagement that I'm like, yeah, this is worth it. But this inner bully is saying, well, you should have gone to bed early. I mean, that's so unfair. It's like you're a rag doll mm -hmm. between yourself, you know? Um, so yeah, it's a really important thing to highlight. Those words are not helpful at all. <laughs> the, the, the inner bully critic doesn't want us when you come right down to it, to enjoy ourselves and indulge. And 
right. we all do need occasionally to prioritize making sure we're yeah. enjoying ourselves and making sure we're allowed to have some indulgences here and there. Yeah. Knowing it's still hopefully under the broad heading of still staying disciplined as best as you can overall. Yeah. And while the inner bully, um, I find the inner critic is like, I look at it as a, I was just talking to a client about this the other day. I'm like, it's like a guard dog for another part of yourself that deeply believes that you have to be a certain way in order to be safe, lovable, accepted, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even really see it as the, the king operator or the queen operator. It's more like a, a, a guard dog. It's like, no, you have to do everything perfectly or because the queen says, the king says, you're not going to be safe, lovable, accepted, liked, adored, whatever, unless you're this way. So be perfect, be perfect all the time, or you're never, you know, and so really, it's kind of, I find rising above that inner bully, inner critic of like, who, what is the belief system that I have about myself or life that is causing this to get activated all the time and doing, you know, some deeper work with, with whatever, you know, therapist, coach approaches, modalities you have to get to those deeper belief systems that you hold about yourself and your role in the world and who you are and what makes you safe, lovable, valuable, et cetera, is really where like, I find that the inner bully and inner critic gets to calm down. And that's why I like your approach so much of like seeing your intrinsic worth of who you mm -hmm. are. That has nothing to do with anything that you achieve, nothing to do with anything that you look like like, you know, and we, we cognitively know this for other people, right? It's like, oh, okay. I don't expect, uh, you know, some loving, beautiful old woman to look a certain way for me or to do something for me or anyone else to be lovable. I just see that she has a beautiful soul and a beautiful heart and she is perfectly enough as she is. So we can get there with others, but there's a lot of work to be able to get there for ourselves sometimes. And I think strategies like that of like seeing it, seeing it, seeing it, identifying it, identifying it, eventually getting to a place where you actually feel it of like, wow, I am like a beautiful soul. I am like, I am a just loving, uh, curious, open-minded, intelligent, adventurous, or even shy or mm -hmm. even loving, scared, timid, even loving, um, quiet, you know, some of these things that might not have been, uh, reflected back to you as lovable as a child, loving all those parts. Um, I am very boisterous. Um, I interrupt a lot and I love myself. I love that. I'm very spazzy and spontaneous, like loving all the sides of ourselves. I think, you know, proactively through mm -hmm an exercise like that is key to getting past that like king queen that's like you have to be certain ways <laughs> to be lovable <laughs> and I, if i may just add there's there's yes. three three p words here that mm -hmm. i want to just kind of quickly follow up on one of the p words is a p word that we all really need to use a heck of a lot less and that's the word perfect because using that word, I think we both know, it sets up a perfectly impossible standard. Right. Perfection. It just doesn't exist. But the word is used all over the place. It's a standard that you can't reach. However, there are two other P words that I'm a, I, I cannot encourage enough. And those P words are practice and patience. We need, as, as you're basically saying, we need to practice these kind of tools. And in order to really get the best of practice in them, we also need to be patient with ourselves. So many people will end up not sticking with tools like this or sabotaging themselves in weight loss or sabotaging themselves in other ways by becoming really impatient. The, mm -hmm. the inner bully critic loves when we're impatient because then we're more likely to get so frustrated, to get so discouraged that we give up on these tools out the window, they go right back to where we started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and perfection thing, you know, often I find in, in, in the health realm of health goals, it's like, well, I just want to be fit or I just want to be more energetic, but like, we don't even really know. Most of the time people don't, they have no idea what that even means. Right. It's just, it's just better than I am now is the pattern. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what, what the, I, I just need to be better than I am now. Right. 
And that just shows like that heart woundedness that I have so much compassion on. Right. But, and it, it challenges people sometimes when I say things like this, they're like, girl, I am 300 pounds. Like I need to be better than I am now. And I'm like, "Mm." Mm -hmm. but, and, and when I talked about loving yourself now, like people confuse that with complacency. A lot of times like Mm self-love gets confused with complacency. I'm like, no, I don't self-love if you're, you know, uh, 350 pounds and your frame is maybe one of somebody who's 150 pounds naturally. Loving yourself now doesn't mean you just don't do anything about it. It's the exact opposite, right? It's showing up for yourself. It's what do I want for me? Like, I believe in me. I got me, you know? And so the idea of um, perfection of, you know, I'm trying to reach this certain outside of me goal. It's understandable. I think a lot of us get like that when we're naive um, about a new area of our life that we're pursuing, you know, maybe you're going after business or you're trying to become a therapist and perfection is being where Dr. Sid is like, he's got online clients. He was doing that. He's perfect. You know, it's like, it's kind of a naive, uh, viewpoint, right. It's like, we have this outside of us extrinsic idea of what we think perfection is, and we're never going to be good enough until we get to that. But really, you know, if you look at nature, nature is a perfect chaos. Mm. It's a perfect mess. It's unpredictable, but it's beautiful that way, you know, and seeing that and loving that and seeing that about ourselves, that if, if we're going to look at perfection as anything, it's going to be just loving the, the whole gamut, all of it, the imperf- the Im- loving, the imperfection is when you start to see everything as perfection, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I love the idea of seeing perfection in nature. Mm-hmm. And for anyone who's at all, I'll, I'll just sort of add this to the mix. Anyone who's at all religiously or personally, spiritually inclined, you know, there is room. I know it certainly works well for me to think of God, divine spirit, and so forth as the spiritual form of perfection. And, you know, that's not something everybody turns to or goes to or embraces, but if it's something that resonates for you, it's another way to think of perfection and to also think of a kind of on, on again, a personal note for me on a spiritual level, non-religious, but personal level to go to God, to go to something spiritual is very comforting by itself. Yes. And it also can be you know, a, a really good reminder to ground myself and center myself and to get back if I'm off track Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Thank you for adding that. And um, as we kind of close up here, unfortunately, I just want to offer up some resources for people. So first of all, Dr. Sid's website is Sydney J Cohen, C O H E N PhD.com. Um, and there are links to your books that we mentioned there. Um, and also, you know, your therapy philosophy and all of your different, you know, YouTube video services and all of that. Um, but I just, I wanted to give you a chance, you know, if somebody, it's not, obviously you do more than just betrayal, trauma and weight loss, <laughs> but if somebody wanted to partake of more from you, what would you recommend for them? Well, I, and I appreciate that. Um, so I, I do in my work, um, a lot of work with couples also, I do work with clinical conditions, certainly like anxiety, PTSD, OCD, certainly eating disorders are in the mix. So from a, a, a treatment clinical standpoint, I go there a little bit more of say, and maybe a coaching realm would be ang- ang- anger management, stress management. It's when a betrayal is not something that's totally traumatized someone that can certainly come into the mix. Um, I also do a lot of work with grief. If somebody wants to at least inquire and find out you know, about my services, discuss fees and so forth, the best way to reach me really would be, and as you just said, Tara, check out my website. So it's really the way to go is to email me. Hmm. My email address is all lowercase D-R-S-I-D-C-O-H-E-N at Gmail. And if you email me, you are guaranteed to get an email back. And I would welcome that. 
Mm, thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that you've done over the years. You know, you've been in the trenches with people for a little while now, you know, so I'm sure you've had a lot of experience with all sorts of everything. So whatever you're dealing with, it's probably not the first time Dr. Sid has seen what you're experiencing. At least maybe you have grape flavor. They had orange flavor, but you know, the roots are likely the same. So if you're dealing, you know, anything like, I think so often we underestimate how much we need help and support, right? Where we got, where I got this, it's fine. I'm, I'm getting past it, but like you can get past it in so much more healthy ways that really transform your entire version of reality if you seek out support. So if anything is speaking to you right now in terms of like something you're trying to work through, reach out to Dr. Sid or obviously somebody else, but reach out, you know? And, and I think what we both know, Tara, is that somebody who reaches out who's been really reluctant to reach out and really avoiding reaching out. And then they finally push themselves to reach out. That's called courage. Yeah. And I'm sure I speak for both of us. We want people to be courageous, to come forward, take care of yourself, get any coaching or therapy that you need because we're there to take your courage and run with it. Mm -hmm. And it's also a pat to fluff your ego a little. It's also a pattern of highly successful people is to get help, right? Most, most highly successful people have therapists, coaches, mentors, like they all the time, you know, so it is a success pattern as well. So it's not just like something you do because you're all messed up. It's actually an intelligent way <laughs> to approach life is to get help from people who are expert at what they do with the things that you're not expert at. <laughs> we, so. we need to practice what we preach. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dr. Sid, thank you so much for coming on again. Appreciate Thanks you. So, Thanks so much for having me, Tara. This was great.